will now begin the second lecture on Jude. Read verse 11. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Here it speaks of three representatives of false teachers. First, it speaks of the way of Cain. Cain was the first son of Adam. He offered his produce as an offering to God. However, God did not accept his sacrifice. Why didn't God accept his sacrifice? It was because it was a sacrifice without blood. Also, it was a ritualistic and dead sacrifice, and hence God did not accept it. When God did not accept his offering, Cain killed his brother. False prophets' lives are like the way of Cain. They think they are serving God, but God does not accept their superficial sacrifices. Rather, they persecute those who worship God in spirit and in truth. We must worship God according to His word. In Leviticus chapter 10 verse 1, Aaron's two sons were punished for offering sacrifices with unauthorized fire. This prophesied that false teachers in the end of times will walk in the way of Cain. Second is Balaam's error. Balaam appears in Numbers chapter 22, verses 21 through 30, and he perished because he did not walk in a way that was acceptable before God. He followed his greed against God's word and was punished for it. He perished because his greed caused him to walk down the crooked path of ill-gotten gain. When you pray for something you know is not right, you are praying like Balaam. When you know that your work is out of step with God's will, you are walking the way of Balaam. We must find God's will through the Bible. Once we find God's will, we must then pray for strength to act according to His will. Also, even if we find a good way, if it does not agree with God's word, we must not walk down it. If something strikes our conscience, then we must forsake that way. We must not seek material possessions that come from greed. Balaam was about to tell the king of Moab how to destroy the people of Israel and so prove to be a thorn for Israel. Third, it speaks of Korah's rebellion. Numbers chapter 16 verses 1 through 3 says, Korah formed a group and rebelled against Moses. Korah was Moses' cousin. They were from the same household and were close relatives. When Korah saw Moses, he thought God was only with Moses. He thought God was only using Moses. That is why he rebelled against Moses. 
However, by God's judgment, he was swallowed up alive by the earth. Anyone who becomes a stumbling block to God's work of salvation will surely be punished. Anyone who opposes God's work of salvation, like Korah, will be punished. Cain, Balaam, and Korah brought damage to the kingdom of God. Cults today also hinder God's work of salvation and therefore will receive judgment. Faith is established under God's order and authority. We must stand firm in the de denomination, church, family, and society that God established. This is how we do God's works and receive grace and blessings. Read verse 12. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. Here it speaks of the four characteristics of false prophets. First, they are blemishes at your love feasts. Love feasts indicate feasts of love among believers. There were feasts in the early church as well. The false prophets were blemishes at these feasts. There are rocks underwater that are not easily seen. When a ship hits a rock, it will be wrecked. Heretics discreetly enter the church like these rocks and destroy the faith of believers. They are like rocks underwater so they are not easily seen from the outside. Heretics sing praises and bring their Bibles to church like believers. They seem to do the same as believers when they worship. However, they use feasts to gain benefits for themselves and also to deceive believers. Judas Iscariot appeared to be a disciple of Jesus on the outside. However, Judas was controlled by Satan. He sold Jesus for 30 coins of silver, and he was destroyed after being a slave to the devil. Second, false prophets are shepherds who only feed themselves. They only think about themselves and don't take care about the flock of sheep. They control the flock in harsh and cruel ways, make them food for wild animals, and make them wander about. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 2 through 6, it prophesies woe against false shepherds. However, a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus is our good shepherd, and he died on the cross as a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and produced much fruit. Third, false prophets are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind. 
clouds without rain frustrate the hearts of farmers. It deceives farmers. Farmers are happy when they see clouds during a time of drought. However, farmers are disappointed by clouds without rain. It would be better if the cloud didn't come so that at least dew could form. Dew does not form when there are clouds in the sky and it will damage the crops. Like this, false prophets do not feed the flock with God's word. They make the flock go hungry and make them disappointed, causing them harm. Fourth, false prophets are autumn trees without fruit and uprooted. This means that false prophets have no hope. Autumn trees do not have hope of bearing fruit. They die and die again, and there is no hope to live. There is no hope of fruit even in the next season. In the same way, heretics are cut from works of spiritual life, so they are dead. They have absolutely no hope because they have been uprooted by its roots. They threw away the basic truth of Christ, which is the foundation of faith. Salvation cannot come to such people. They are not able to repent. They are most pitied. Verse 13, they are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Here the verse speaks of the end of times of false prophets. First it says that they foam up their own shame. When the waves of the ocean crash, it brings up much foam. However, when the foam disappears, there is nothing left. In the same way, heretics may sound good and their actions may be impressive, but there is nothing there. Like foam, they come and go quickly. They are shamed before God and before others. Their characters move about like the rough waves of the ocean. They fight and quarrel and are rough in their actions. However, true faith is always quiet and peaceful in heart. There is also gentleness humility, forgiveness, and love. Second, the end result of false prophets is the blackest darkness that has been reserved forever. Heretics move in the world without any true authority. They entice many believers to try to make them follow them. However, their end is the darkness that has been reserved for the devil. God will judge them and send them to hell. Third, the end of false prophets is like the wandering stars. They are like stars that cannot remain in one place. They cannot stand on the truth and they follow false teachings while wandering about. 
they do not belong anywhere. They wander through spiritual darkness. They will one day end up in eternal darkness and receive judgment. Verses 14 through 16 speak of Enoch's prophecy. Verse 14, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. Enoch was the seventh descendant of Adam. He walked with God for 300 years and was taken up to heaven. Enoch serves as an example as to what will happen to all believers when they will be raised from the dead and enter heaven. Enoch prophesied about the return of Jesus and judgment. When Jesus returns, he will come with thousands of his holy ones. Those who have already entered will come to this land. At that time, those who are living will be taken up to welcome the Lord in the air. At that time, the Lord will judge the works and words of the ungodly. Verse 15, to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. We believers will not receive the judgment of hell because of our faith in Jesus. However, all ungodly acts will be judged. All secular acts that we committed when we left God will be judged. We will be judged for not putting God at the center and for acting according to our greed. We will be judged for all ungodly words that we spoke. The things that we speak do not go away. The ungodly words that we speak will be judged before God. Words that harmed the work of God's salvation will be punished. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 All the false teachings about the Bible will also be judged. We must be careful with our words and our actions. We must be like Enoch and walk with God in godliness. Not only are lies wrong, but also are false assumptions. When we look at the words of a person, we can see his character. Those who speak evil have evil hearts. On, on the other hand, those who speak good words have good hearts. Those who speak words of love will have hearts of love. Those who speak nonsense will have nonsensical characters. Verse 16 speaks about those who have acted in unrighteousness and will be judged. Verse 16, these men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others 
for their own advantage. First, they are grumblers and fault finders. They complain and resent everything. Complaining is a sign that one does not trust in God's sovereignty. The Israelites perished when they complained against God in the desert. Heretics will receive the wrath of God in the end for complaining and resenting God. They will not enter God's kingdom and will receive the judgment of hell. We must receive both the good and bad with belief that they come from God. Jesus received the cup of the cross from God. Those who complain and are never satisfied cannot receive the grace of God. We must remember God's grace from the past and be thankful in the present. Second, they act according to their evil desires. They do not think about God's plan and will. They act according to their greed. Sinful desires lead us to worldly ways. If believers walk in the ways of the world, they will leave the will of God and walk down the path to destruction. Third, they boast about themselves. Boasting is of the world. Boasting of the things of the world is evidence that God's love is not in their hearts. Boasting of oneself is arrogance. Paul had many things to boast about in a worldly point of view. Yet, after believing in Jesus, he considered all worldly things rubbish. Paul only boasted of the gospel, the cross, and in his weaknesses. Even our Lord Jesus did not boast of himself. Fourth, they are those who flatter others for their own advantage. They flatter others for their own advantage. False prophets flattered others, and this was a sin deserving of God's judgment. Verses 17 through 19 say that we should remember the prophecies of the apostles. Verses 17 through 19. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere nat natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. The apostles said that people will be corrupted in the end of times. Just as Enoch prophesied, the ungodly will act according to their sinful desires and will follow ungodly desires. In the end of times, many will forsake God and live according to their sinful passions. Even believers leave the spiritual life and turn to the fleshly life. As a result, 
many people will inevitably suffer in the end of times. Second Timothy chapter three verse one says, "There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure." They put God second in their lives, and put their desires first. Jesus also asked if the Son of Man would find faith on the earth when He returned. The ungodly despise believers when we stand for the truth. Many people deny the second coming of Jesus. These people make their own sex and use power to go against the truth, as they follow humanism. Satan always incites complaints in the heart instead of peace. Satan wants people to hate, be jealous, and envy instead of love. Satan causes division among people. He makes people divided among themselves and turn against each other. These people do not have the Holy Spirit. Because they belong to the flesh, Satan will rule over those who do not have the Holy Spirit. An evil spirit tormented King Saul when the Spirit of God departed from him. When the Holy Spirit leaves. Seven evil spirits will take over the heart. The wicked live according to the flesh, and they do not think about God's holy will. Verses twenty through twenty-three. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. And pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others, show mercy mixed with fear. Hating even even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Lastly, he encourages believers to build themselves up. Many heresies will tempt believers in the end of times. Therefore, we believers who are saved must build ourselves up. This does not merely refer to a confession of faith. We must continuously build ourselves up as people of God, just as we would build a building. Then, how can we build ourselves? There are four ways. First. We must build ourselves on the holy faith. God wants us to build ourselves on the faith that He has first given us. The foundation of this faith is the basic doctrine of Jesus Christ. We are to hold on to these teachings in our hearts. And proclaim them with our mouths. There are five basic doctrines: the birth of Jesus through the Virgin Mary, Jesus's death on the cross, 
the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, and the return of Jesus. Faith in these doctrines is set apart from the claims of heretics. There is no other way to salvation other than through Jesus. Other ways come from cults. If we do not build ourselves on a solid foundation, there will be a time when the building will fall. We must build our lives on the holy faith. Second, we must pray in the Holy Spirit. We cannot build ourselves by our own strength. We receive strength when we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 says, We must pray in the Spirit on all occasions. We grow closer to God when we pray to God. We can repent when we discover our sins. God helps us when we call out to God. God gives us wisdom and strength. We must pray through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In order to pray by the Holy Spirit, we must repent of our sins, humbly seek God, and call out to God. We must pray as in the pains of childbirth. We must give our time and energy and pray without ceasing. Third, how can we build ourselves? We must guard our hearts in God's love. We are holy people of God. Satan and the world are always at work to take away our faith. We must guard ourselves. We must make sure that we do not fall away from this precious faith and that we are not deceived by the devil. Even if a person gains the whole world, he gains nothing if he forfeits his soul. We must use whatever we have to build ourselves. We must use the good environments God has placed us in. We must raise the children God has given us in the right way. We must use our time and possessions and energy. If we do not keep our faith, we waste our time. How can we keep our faith? We must remain in God's love. God's love is unconditional and sacrificial as He gave His one and only Son whom He loves. We must be thankful for this love. We must rejoice in this love. Then we will keep our faith no matter what powers attack us. Romans chapter 8 verse 35 Fourth, how can we keep our faith? We must wait upon the mercy of Jesus Christ. In order to build ourselves, the mercy of the Lord is absolutely necessary. This is because it is not easy to build ourselves. 
we fall very easily, but we must get up with the strength of the Lord's mercy. When we have hope to get up, the mercy of the Lord will remain in us. God has saved us in His mercy. We live under God's mercy as we live on this earth. When we receive God's mercy and show His mercy to others, God's mercy will continue to remain in us. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James chapter 2 verse 13 It says in verse 22 that we must be merciful towards those who doubt. This means that we must have mercy on those who are being deceived by heretic ideologies. They have not yet been completely deceived by heretics. We must encourage them and be merciful towards them so that they can stand upright. For some, we must have mercy on them as if rescuing them from fire. We must do all that we can to rescue them and guide them to the path of faith. However, we must not debate with those who have become completely heretical. We must not even greet those who are in the cults. Second John chapter 1 verse 10. Verses 24 through 25 pray for God's blessing. Jude concludes his letter by praising the almighty power of God. He says that this God will bless believers. It is a confession of trust in Jesus Christ and God. Verse 24 says, To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Jude describes who God is. First, God is God who always keeps us from falling. In the end of times, many false prophets try to deceive us. However, God protects those who love the truth and observe God's word. In John chapter 10 verse 28, it says, No one can snatch us out of God's hand. If we obey God's word, God will protect us through all difficulties. Historically, there were many heretics in Christianity. In such times, God protected faithful believers and the gospel continued to spread. It is God's great protection and miracle that the correct faith of the apostolic age was passed down to us today. The devil uses all kinds of schemes to bring down the truth. Yet because of God's great protection, this truth has been passed down to us today. Second, what is God like? God is God who removes obstacles. He keeps us from falling from the false teachings of heretics. No matter how powerful false teachings may be, 
God's protection will keep us from harm. God's power is far greater than the devil's power. Third, what is God like? God makes us blameless and joyful before His glory. God clothed us believers with the righteousness of Christ. He allows us to undergo trials and training that are like fire. Thus, He will make us blameless and complete before the Lord. He will make us stand in joy and glory when we later stand before God. We cannot fathom how great God's grace and mercy is towards us. We must look upon this living hope and we must go forward in faith. Verse 25 says, To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. We too must become people of faith who give glory to God alone. With this, we will conclude the second lecture on Jude. Thank you.